Hello, I'm Steve Janicki and I'm standing on the bed of the Fitzgerald River on the south coast of Western Australia. Most of the travellers crossing the bridge above me will hardly take a second look at it. The Fitzgerald is one of 15 medium to large saline rivers lined up along 700 kilometres of the south coast of Western Australia. Hugging the coast between these are many smaller catchments. The rivers in the northern and eastern parts of the region appear to have been saline before European settlement, but many have become saltier during the last century. Nevertheless, fresh water can still be found in some catchments. Salty rivers have some immunity from the increasing demand for domestic and industrial water supplies, but there's a downside, unusable may come to be thought of as useless. However, there is another viewpoint. The salt rivers should be valued in their own right. For more than a decade, Geraldine and I have been exploring the South Coast rivers to try and get a better understanding of how they work. Each river is like a barometer and continuously records the pressures that bear upon the surrounding landscape. They're responding to the way we treat the land as well as to the many natural changes including climatic conditions. And that can tell us something about where the environment is headed as it carries us along with it. A common assumption is that a river is little more than a drain and something to be engineered to make sure it gets water away as soon as possible. When it gets a bit wild, the tradition has been to try and tame it with machinery and concrete. There's no doubt that draining the land is a useful service. But taking a blinkered approach ignores the fact that the streams are also the lifeline of the fragile organic network we call the ecosystem. And although it may be comforting to believe there really isn't a problem with how we manage our Australian streams, the facts keep getting in the way. The problem is that expedience usually has the casting vote. Thousands of kilometres of streams like this one are succumbing to an ecological death by a thousand cuts. Australia-wide, many of them are starting to look much the same, geriatric drains on life support. River views can seem uninspiring from the South Coast Highway, but that's deceptive.
There's another service the river provides, and maybe the most important one. It makes our world tolerable to live in. But unhealthy systems send a clear message that people are out of touch with their critical life support system. To help define what a healthy salt river means, you have to look carefully at the various elements that make it what it is. Mountain ranges are scarce on the south coast and the inland parts of the salt rivers are perched on a plateau called the Yilgarn. Long strings of salt lakes provide evidence that ancient rivers once flowed north and then eastward. But now they meander southward from a modest altitude of about 300 metres above sea level to the coast 50 to 100 kilometres away. Here on the undulating plains, many subdued creeks secretly come together forming a complex network of channels. I say secretly because in the flattish countryside, it can be hard to spot them. The most fundamental change that has taken place here during the past thousand years has been extensive clearing of the land for agriculture. Of course, it's history now, and lamenting over it won't bring back the good old days. Some changes are unlikely to be reversed, but how we handle them will be critical. I hinted at the spectre of a changing climate. It's more than a spectre. The average rainfall in the southwest corner of Western Australia has already dropped significantly from the mid 1970s. The southern catchments support broadacre farming, mainly crops, sheep and cattle. There are some small towns, an occasional mining operation, a handful of overworked park ranges and a few research scientists rummaging about. I'm not sure what this is. These bits look like gypsum crystals. Tourism is an important economic incentive, but travellers, like the streams, gravitate to the panoramic coast. Iconic landmarks may win the admiration of tourists, but it's the less dramatic areas like these that, taken all together, 
will determine the future of the Australian landscape. This is where nature can really slap us in the face. When Australia and the Antarctic landmass were torn apart, the edge of the continent in this region fractured and slumped. If you have an inquisitive streak, the subtle evidence of the ancient geological toing and froing can be found scattered throughout the bushland. Over there you can see a remnant of softer dolerite rock that once squeezed through weaknesses in the granite and was then eroded away. And there you can see old river sediments perched on top of weathered rock. In the middle reaches of many of the salt rivers, the bed has cut deeply into the granite, forming cascades and waterfalls. A thick blanket of fragile rock called spongilite covers large areas of the coast, creating distinctive landmarks. Spongilite is composed of colourful sediments and the remnants of long dead marine sponges. The weather pattern ensures that the flows in the salt rivers are somewhat erratic. It's either boom or bust, and the aquatic environment of the rivers is best described as a series of pools. These are usually little more than a couple of metres deep, but they can be up to an impressive 10 metres or more. This pool is typical. In low rainfall years, many pools may dry up completely, and more often than not, they're only connected by low flows. This isn't a native species. It's an eastern state's yabby. It's probably clammed out of a dam. The intermittent floods are powerful and put roads, fences, paddocks, farm dams and stock at risk. We've found that the length of the more substantial pools is typically three or four hundred metres, and sometimes they're more than a kilometre long. This grand pool on the Bremer River is one of the largest, two kilometres long when full, although it's relatively shallow. Along a southern salt river there are roughly a hundred or so substantial pools, and a similar number of smaller ones scattered in between. The pools drape across the landscape like a jewel necklace, giving each catchment a unique aquatic signature. Not all pools are the same, and they provide a way to understand river health. The evaporation rate in this part of the world is much higher than the yearly rainfall, so even trickle flows are important. When evaporation exceeds the inflow, the pools get saltier. The salinity and water temperature are key characteristics of the pool ecosystems. In hot weather, shallow waters can quickly heat up to 30 degrees centigrade or more. Deeper water moderates average water temperatures, and of course, shading by the fringing trees and shrubs plays an important role. For these reasons, increased erosion in the catchment and the unnecessary loss of fringing vegetation pose a threat to the aquatic life. The last pool on a number of the south coast salt rivers is a shallow estuarine lagoon separated from the ocean by a narrow sandbar.
For other streams, there's a quiet finish in a salt lake, maybe an old estuary that has become completely landlocked. The large surface area and shallow depth give the estuaries their unique character. At the end of a dry summer, the water may be as much as four times saltier than the ocean. The relentless waves and currents of the Southern Ocean build the sandbar and can confine the river for many years at a time until a major flood finally raises the water level enough to breach the bar. The estuary bed may be quite firm, but often it is a deep ooze composed of clay, fine sand and organic matter. In these conditions, hydrogen sulphide gas can be generated. If you disturb the bed, the characteristic rotten egg smell immediately assaults your nose. An important feature of estuary waters is that they can become stratified. This means that the water forms two layers, fresher near the surface, and hypersaline near the bottom, along with less oxygen and higher nutrient levels. Bacteria break down the organic matter, and if circumstances are right, they can quickly suck oxygen out of the rest of the water body, creating what is called anoxic conditions. Fish rely on oxygen in the water, and if they're trapped in an anoxic area, they will quickly suffocate. High salt levels and low oxygen in the water are a potent brew. And the interface between the estuary bed and the water column plays a critical part in these processes. That's why the material that comes down the river from the catchment and settles here is important to the health of the system. In part two of Salt Rivers, we move back up into the catchment to take a closer look at what goes on in a typical stream reach. <laughs> 